morning then. Um, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on fungicide resistance in Western Australia, brought to you by the Australian Fungicide Resistance Extension Network, or AFRIN for short. My name is Kylie Island and I'm the Extension Coordinator for AFRIN. I will be facilitating today's webinar. Um, but before we get started, I'll just do some brief housekeeping. If I can grab the next slide, Jeff. Uh, just basically everyone should be muted. Please keep on mute. Um, to ask a question, please use the Q&A function and I'll just have a shot of what that looks like on the next. And be kind and we'll get going today. So next slide, Jeff. Yep. Uh, so just for some background, AFRIN the RDC initiative. Um, born of the recognition that fungicide resistant is becoming an increasingly serious and prevalent problem in Australian grains. Um, so our remit is to deliver regionally specific resources and training to help growers and advisors understand the status, risks and management of fungicide resistance in Australian grains. And we're doing this by developing and delivering a fungicide resistance management guide, workshops, information sessions and webinars such as today's, as well as fact sheets, updates and email alerts. Um, and we're able to do this by harnessing the skills and expertise of people all across the country. So we've got plant pathologists, fungicide resistance experts, and comms and extension specialists um, helping us in the team. So on the call with us from the AFRIN, from Ag Communicators in the background, um, who are our technical and comms support. Uh, we have Wes Mayer and Fran Lopez Ruiz from the Centre for Crop and Disease Management at Curtin University, uh, who are our lead experts in fungicide resistance diagnostics and management. Um, and we also have Jeff Thomas and Keith Jayasena from the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, who are our WA regional plant pathologists. And that regional aspect is important, as you'll see on some of the slides, the cases we're seeing across the country are quite disparate across the entire country due to different growing conditions and risks. Um, so presenting today we'll have Jeff and Wes who are both local sand gropers. Um, Jeff grew up on a farm in Durangamungup so you'll have to forgive me for saying how I say that one. I'm evidently not from WA where he developed his love of West Australian ag. Um, he'll no doubt be familiar to many of you. He's been with Deep Herd for more than 25 years and primarily in grains pathology. Um, and he's in that time he's had a focus on research and extension around butt wheat, barley and lupin diseases. Um, and he has a bit of an affinity for lupin development as he's been doing the disease screening for breeding, breeding programs. Um, and Wes is a Perth lad and he has qualifications in molecular genetics and biotechnology from Curtin University. Uh, he joined the fungicide resistance team of what was the Australian Fungicide, Australian Centre for Necrotrophic Fungal Pathogens that then morphed into the CCDM. He joined back in 2011. Uh, Wes has a talent for interrogating the molecular mechanisms of fungicide resistance in the lab, um, especially in the net watches, uh, integral a part of the fungicide resistance group here. Um, so it's with great pleasure now that I leave you in the capable hands of Jeff and Wes who will walk us through fungicide resistance in Golly. Um, and just to clarify, I'm from Jeremungup, not Jeringam up. Um, but yeah, look, uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, Wes and I are going to have, have a bit of a uh, team effort here. Um, and so bear with us as we, we uh, trade places. Uh, today I'm going to, we're going to talk a little bit about resistance in WA, what it is, um, and in a couple of cases, how it's uh, developed. And then maybe have a look a little bit at, at some of the impacts of that of that resistance, how that might be expressed in the field, and then just some general um, hints and tips about about what we can do to, to sort of avoid the issues. Before I um, before I jump into talking about resistance, I guess I'd like to think a little bit about how our perception of the use of fungicides in our cropping system has changed over time. So. If we go all the way back to 1992, which was not long after I started with uh, with what was then Dawa, and I was working with uh, Robert Lockman, who was the preeminent um, serial pathologist uh, in in Western Australia for for 20 or 30 years, 
And uh, Rob was carrying out some, some um, preliminary experiments or some experiments into fungicide and cultivar control of septoria diseases of wheat. Now, when we're talking about fungicide back then, we're talking about uh, tridimethon, uh, propiconazole. They were propiconazole and probably the new kids on the block. Um, and so we were looking at, uh, at the use of fungicides to manage those diseases. And in that paper that you can see the title of there, um, Rob, Rob made a couple of uh, comments. And one of those was that in Western Australia, the control of septoria triticide with tilt, so probiconazole, is rarely used because of the uncertainty of economic returns and the availability of varieties with some resistance to this pathogen. So in 92, we're talking about rarely used. And then he went on to say that fungicide sprays may offer a cost-effective means of reducing losses to triticide and odorum in southwestern, south and southern Western Australia when yield potentials are high and disease levels are moderate. So that's back in 1992. So that was how, how we were, the industry was thinking about fungicides at that time. Flip forward, how has our outlook changed now in 2020? So in Western Australia, uh, the application of fungicides for the control of cereal diseases is widely and routinely used, um, including, in, particularly in Bali, including in low rainfall areas. Certainly something I think that in 1992, we wouldn't have been considering. What we know means of reducing losses to fungal diseases in WA. Notice the rider here that I've put in, where disease is yield limiting and, in reference today, where fungicide is effective. But we've reached the stage of over-reliance and overuse of fungicides to manage crop disease. And that, I think, is, is, is threatening our efficacy. And I guess that's uh, part of the whole deal around uh, why Afrin exists. So I, I, I thought it was interesting to just characterise how over the period of my time in, in, in what is now deep herd, uh, industry uh, usage and acceptance of uh, fungicides for Just a quick look at what cereal fungicide we have. Um, at the time, at the, at the time of that 1992 uh, discussion, really our cereal fungicides were a couple of those group three DMI triazoles. We now have, uh, we now have access to uh, three main groups of fungicide. So we still, we still, our control is still um, reliant and centered on that, that group three DMI fungicides um, of which there is a number of active ingredients available to us. But, over recent times, obviously, we've had access to group 11 uh, strobilurins and group seven SDHI products, both as uh, you, uh, mixed with uh, group three DMIs. Um, and then we see them, see them available in um, uh, foliar fungicide uh, form as seed dressings, as in furrow fungicides. Um, so we have, a, we, have a, we have some choices, um, however, the pro still the majority of our choices are within that uh, group three DMI uh, fungicide group. So fungus draining grain crops. This map is one that's uh, generated by, by Wes and, and people at the CCDM. And it just outlines the uh, different uh, crop and disease uh, interactions for which uh, fungicide resistance has become apparent. Each of those uh, dots indicates basically which of those things has been detected in each of the states of WA. So there's WA, obviously, with um, detections in, in barley with DMI fungicides across three uh, pathogens and in canola as well. We're going to concentrate today on, on barley powdery mildew, barley net form net blotch and barley spot form net blotches as, and the uh, resistance in those uh, pathogens um, to uh, group three DMI fungicides.
It's pretty interesting. I think it's pretty important, actually. And one of the, one of the things that Afrin certainly is um, the, uh, important to, to clarify is what are we talking about when we talk about resistance? So in terms of our, uh, well, in terms of terminology, if we're talking about a disease or, or a uh, isolate that is sensitive, that means it's the fungicide still works. It, it is uh, still sensitive to the impacts or the effects of the fungicide in question. If we say something has reduced sensitivity, that means it might still look like it works okay in the field. Um, maybe you need to use higher rates. There is a bit of a higher risk of developing resistance. And really what we're talking about here is if we were to look at that in the lab, we would see that in a, in a lab test that there is uh, a difference in the growth rate uh, when, when uh, challenged by uh, genetic changes which, which have occurred, which uh, impart some reduced sensitivity, but maybe it's not evident in the field. What we're talking about is basically it's not working. It's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. We're seeing, we're detecting field failure. We're detecting uh, reduced efficacy in the, in the field circumstance. Things that can influence um, fungicide efficacy in the field. And so the confirming, we need to confirm through, through uh, the laboratories that, that this reduced sensitivity or this resistance is present. Um, and by lab detection, we're talking about a measurable decrease in the sensitivity when the fungus is cultured in the lab um, under controlled conditions. So let's have a quick look at that. If we're talking about group three DMI sensitivity in spot form net botch, for example, in a lab detection sense, we have an isolate of the fungus that is still sensitive to the fungicide that is that is uh, being tested. And so, what what the what uh, Wes and all his colleagues do is they will uh, incorporate uh, fungicide, let's say, uh, into a plate of of media with a discriminatory dose of fungicide, and then they just put. Uh, sections of the fungus onto that plate and look at the growth. If the fungus is, is sensitive, we don't see any growth. Basically, the fungicide is fully effective. If we have reduced sensitivity, then we get some growth of the fungus on those plates. So the, the fungicide is still having some effect, but it isn't, it isn't having the full effect. If we've got a resistant type, then basically the fungus is quite happily growing, uh, is actively growing. What we do know with, with, uh, with the, the resistance in spot form net blotch and the resistance to DMI sites is a couple of things. One is it's not necessarily absolute. And so we can have a progression of resistance um, to, to an active ingredient. And so an active, so an active ingredient, ingredient may be more or less uh, effective uh, depending on, on the uh, changes that have occurred in the fungus. The other thing we know is that not all DMI actives are if affected the same. And so in, a, in, in, the terms of, in terms of spot form net blotch, we might see that uh, some active ingredients are, the, the fungus is resistant to some active ingredients, but uh, uh, reduced sense, has reduced sensitivity to others. Obviously then um, what we see is that uh, um, in, those, in the laboratory that uh, molecular testing allows uh, Wes and Fran and others to to look at the DNA of these of, of these fungi and, and look for uh, mutations and and other changes genetically which uh, are indicators of this resistance. So if we're talking about fungicide resistance in WA, um, and as I say, we're going to we're going to talk about uh, barley, and in the and the three major diseases in bar, three diseases in barley for which there is um, recorded and confirmed uh, resistance to DMI fungicides. The first of them is barley powdery mildew. Um, that's been um, 
example, tebuconazole, there is resistance in it to tebuconazole and reduced sensitivity to another of an, a, a number of other DMI fungicides, including propiconazole and flutriopol. This um, for quite some time, um, and and the industry has has worked on ways to address address the issues associated with that powdery mildew resistance. More recently, uh, spot form net blotch, so resistance, reduced sensitivity, and resistance to um, fungicides in spot form net blotch has been identified, and, and Wes will talk about the mechanism. Um, again, we can see that a number of DMI fungicides are impacted, but there is some difference between DMI fungicides in the level of uh, resistance or reduced sensitivity that is evident. Net form net blotch also uh, is, is impacted. And again, similar to spot form net blotch, we can see that there are uh, both resistant and reduced sensitivity uh, levels occurring. Excuse me. This. Okay, I, I, I'm going to briefly touch back on to what's the impact of, of fungicide uh, resistance. I'm going to go back in history a little bit. We're going to talk about barley powdery mildew. I mean, it's probably not front of mind for a lot, a lot of people, but but in fact, in Western Australia, we've been we've been living with uh, fungicide resistance in barley powdery mildew now for for ten years. So, what are we looking at here? So, what is the impact? So this is, uh, this is some, some work done by uh, Richard Oliver and Madeline Tucker many years ago. What we're looking at is um, testing fungicides on excise leaves and looking at the infection type. That is whether, a, whether the, the fungicide is able to um, restrict the, the, inf the infection type. And, and that infection type goes from zero to five and a five being these beautiful fluffy lesions um, a zero being um, an ineffective uh, infection. Pretty simply, if we look at this, in the top half is uh, isolates tested against tebuconazole. PM52 is the sensitive isolate. And we can see that, excuse this banner, we can see that the, um, the uh, tebuconazole with the sensitive isolate has diminished the infection type uh, dramatically at this uh, five micrograms per mil rate and that has stayed at, at that low level. Believe me, it's underneath that word mutation. However, with the PM48, which is a resistant isolate, you can see that in fact, the impact is that these, that uh, the app application of tebuconazole has, result, has not resulted in the same level of uh, impact on the infection type. So that is a direct impact of the fungicide resistance, allowing the fungus to uh, Sporulate on that leaf, leaf tissue. Epoxycon, on the other hand, it, this test um, with two different isolates, we can see when tested with epoxyconazole, they uh, they both ref, ref, reflect that that sensitive approach. In a field sense, how does that look? So this is some work done by Keith Jayasena probably nearly 10 years ago in, in uh, Esperance. This is with Bowdown Barley. And when we talk about powdery mildew um, in Western Australia, we have to remember that in around that 2000, the, the early you know, 2005 to 2010, about 75% of the crop area was sown to susceptible to very susceptible varieties. Powdery mildew was, was everywhere. And really the choices that we had at that time were just DMI fungicides. If we have a look here, we can see that um, in the Untreated uh, bodan barley, we've got significant levels of powdery mildew. The impact in furrow treated, so flut flutriophol treated uh, fertilizer, which um, prior to the identification of fungicide resistance was known to provide protection um, to seedling and tillering uh, crops. We can see high, very high levels of, of infection. So that is the expression of, if we remember back to the uh, slide a couple of ago, we saw that uh, flutriopol was one of the fungicides that was impacted uh, by uh, fungicide resistance. We can see that that fungicide resistance is um, reducing the efficacy of the fungicide in the field. On the other hand, fl fluquinconazole, another DMI, which was not uh, negatively affected by this fungicide resistance, remains effective uh, in that circumstance. 
we would have expected prior to the identification or the onset of fungicide resistance that this flu trifold treated uh, plot would look similar to the flu quinconazole treated plot. So it's an obvious effect, obvious impact of that fungicide resistance in the field. I'm going to hand over to Wes now to talk a little bit about the identification of uh, uh, fungicide resistance in spot form net blotch. Oh, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so I'll just a way of introduction. So this is probably the first indication here we're seeing on this slide um, of where we found a clear indication of field failure in um, net blotches. So this was a field in the South Stirlings um, back in 2017. And you can see it had been treated with a succession of five um, fungicide applications, all of which contained at least DMI fungicide. And you can see despite that, there's actually still a very high level of infection that was found in this field. Um, Oh, yeah. so we just go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, so what we're seeing here is over the next couple of years, we looked at the distribution of um, DMI resistance in spot form as well as in the net form. Um, so this is looking at the, up to the 2019 season. So we see that we'd found the um, this highly resistant um, spot form um, in several locations around um, the Great Southern, um, predominantly clustered around the South Stirlings region, and then we'd also found it in a few sites around the Esperance region. So those are those points that are highlighted in red. And then we've also got um, the reduced sensitivity, as Jeff was mentioning earlier, we've also found reduced sensitivity in a handful of locations. Um, this was up to 2019 as well. So again, predominantly around the Esperance region and then a, a site further north. And then we've also got over on the uh, right-hand side, net form net watch. Again, and up to the 2019 season, we can see that there's a bit more of a spread um, in terms of the locations where we've detected um, both reduced sensitivity and resistance. Um, so in the, up to, into the uh, wheat, wheat belt and northern regions. Um, so if we go to the next slide again. Um, so this was the cohort study that we did in the 2019 season. So we had uh, recruited 170 um, growers and we received over 300 uh, barley samples. And what we basically found from that, that um, in comparison to the maps that I was showing you earlier, if we look at the resistance situation in spot form now, based on the survey from 2019, you can actually see that um, resistance is a lot more common. Resist well, res resistance and reduced sensitivity are both a lot more common and more widely distributed than we had uh, thought uh, prior. Um, so if we want to go to the next slide, so this is showing um, basically the results of those kind of plate tests that Jeff was summarizing earlier. So we have, we have the, the fungus that's been um, grown on plates with different um, concentrations of uh, different fungicides. In this case, we've got seven different DMI fungicides and you can see that we've got um, these sensitive isolates, we've got the re resistant isolates, and then we've got also these reduced sensitive isolates that may not be necessarily correlated with field failures of the compounds. Um, and you can see as Jeff was, um, compounds are gonna be equally um, compromised by the mutations that these resistant or reduced sensitive isolates have. So we have, um, for example, if you can look at, um, Tepiconazole, for example, is um, much more compromised by the mutations we found when compared to epoxyconazole, for example. So we have here in brackets uh, resistance, resistance factors. So basically, they are looking at if we have a reduced sensitive isolate or a 
resistant isolate, how, how many more times resistant or, re or how much more reduced sensitive is it compared to the sensitive? So basically we can have it's 50 times more resistant in the, the most resistant isolates. And then you have propiconazole 36 times Epoxyconazole, it's only around 10 times. I mean, that's still relatively high, but it's, you can see that there is a big range in the, the effect that these mutations will have on the sensitivity. Um, yeah, if we go to the next slide as well. Um, so it's not just a case that we have spot form that's resistant and net form that's resistant. We actually have hybrids of the two species. So that first slide that um, I started on, where I was that had the, the what was essentially the first clear indication of DMI field failure in um, spot form of net blotch, that actually turned out to be what we believe is actually a hybrid spot and net form. So we have genetic evidence that these isolates that have the um, these combinations of mutations are actually they have ancestry from net and spot form. So they're basically they're a derived from some sort of hybridization. Basically like a, a mule is a descendant from a, a donkey and a horse. This is the same thing, right? Like it's a it's a it's a combination of two. And what we hypothesize, because we see in this hybrid it actually has particular mutations that have been found in net form as well as particular mutations in spot form that it's actually acquired a combination of mutations from both species and that's why we have this highly resistant phenotype because it's got a combination of mutations that have been otherwise found in the species. Um, and we've also got in this chart here that shows um, basically the genetic relatedness of these spot form isolates or hybrid spot form isolates and net form uh, isolates as well, basically showing that all these um, hybrids that have this combination of mutations and this high level of resistance, they also are all identical to each other. So they're clones, they're identical twins, they're very, very close, um, which is interesting because they've actually been found in quite disparate locations. So you can see highlighted on the map on the right hand side, they're actually the isolates that are coming from the South Stirlings cluster and those ones that are also coming from the Esperance uh, region, they're actually genetically identical to each other, which is actually quite an interesting and somewhat surprising um, finding. Uh, yeah, so I think we can go to the next slide. Oh yeah, and I'll hand it back to Jeff now. Thanks, Wes. <clears throat> so, so just um, moving along uh, through a little bit more of understanding of, of what the impacts of, of this resistance that, that Wes has been talking about and, and, and that has been identified and what, what its impact might be in the field. One of the interesting things that we've, that we've noted is that, in fact, there may be some, Wes has talked about this, uh, this hybrid and um, the, initial, the initial detections were in Oxford barley. And uh, when we've tested um, isolates, these resistant isolates um, across a range of varieties, what we've, what we've noted is that um, both a sensitive type and a resistant type are able to infect across all, all uh, uh, varieties. However, it is apparent that the, uh, the hybrid resistant variety appears to be more virulent on Oxford than it is uh, potentially on other varieties. And so in glasshouse testings, testing where we've inoculated with pure, pure uh, isolates of, of both types, we've noticed that, um, that the, the resistant type has a, has a greater virulence on Oxford than it does on, on other varieties and may have a somewhat reduced virulence on across uh, most other varieties. However, um, Wes referred to the cohort study that CCDM have been doing, and part of that has been looking at across a range of, of paddocks at, at, and, and looking for the presence of resistance. And what 
what that study has shown is that um, spot form net blotch, the presence of, of resistant spot form net blotch is not restricted to Oxford. In fact, uh, that pathotype or that isolate has been detected across a range of varieties. Um, obviously, uh, to a greater, greater degree at this time in um, higher rainfall uh, southern region environments. Um, and obviously, um, we can see here that RGT planet is, is, is well represented. And I think that's uh, probably a lot to do with the, with the uh, representation of that variety in the regions that have been tested. But what this is saying is that, um, that the, uh, whilst there may be a greater virulence in Oxford, this uh, resistant pathotype is obviously still able to and uh, to infect across a range of varieties and will therefore, the, will therefore perpetuate um, within our barley uh, cropping system. Just a quick, um, we, talked, we showed how, how the barley powdery mildew impacted on, on field control. How does this uh, resistance in spot form net blotch re, uh, reflect on DMI efficacy in the field? Um, this is a bit of work done by Andrea Hills from DPIRT in our, so she's from our Esperance office. Um, she was made aware, and this is one of those dots, actually one of those dots on, on Wes's map. Um, she was made aware of a paddock in, in the daily up region of Oxford barley that had had a fungicide applied, a propiconazole fungicide applied at that Z30 stage, which was uh, basically relatively ineffective. And that there was um, quite rampant uh, spot form net blotch in this, in this crop. Uh, testing of that, of that uh, by, by the CCDM guys uh, um, confirmed uh, the, the group three resistance. So Andrea, Andrea set up a small trial in this paddock. Um, so at that, at, that, at that booting, late booting time, when disease was actually quite severe, and so certainly not a, not a this was set up as, a, as an experimental uh, situation just to look at the impact of, of different fungicides and, and the impact of that resistance on fungicide efficacy. Um, Andrea applied a range of products and you can see the products or actives there on, on the graph. Um, at that sort of late booting stage um, to a highly infected paddock. What we're looking at here is the green leaf area retention on the leaf sheath. So the infection was, was, was uh, significant. And so um, the, what this is reflecting is the ability of, the, of those fungicides to manage the disease, or reduce the impact of disease on the loss of green leaf area on that leaf sheath. And so, about four weeks after spraying, we can see that, that the uh, DMI fungicides uh, have basically been ineffective in retaining green leaf area, whilst the uh, group 11 and group 7 products have, which are not affected by this DMI resistance, have had some impact on the net blotch, the spot form net blotch uh, infection and the retention of green, green area on the sheath. So that's a pretty obvious disease impact that we've seen from the lack of control. What we do know is in fact that when we, when we take that uh, to a yield situation and look at the, the grain yield, we can see that again, those DMI fungicides, or certainly the, the two standalone DMI fungicides have had basically no impact on yield. Um, the uh, Prezaro, which is, a, which is a mix of two fungicides, uh, not significant impact. DMI, DMI products have had a greater impact. And just for the interest, um, there's a pretty strong correlation between the, the, the ability to maintain that green area and the uh, subsequent uh, yield. So what's the take? Probably I might go to the bottom first and say, well, uh, resistance has impacted the field performance of DMI fungicide. The, the photo that uh, Wes showed at the start where he explained how, how that uh, resistance has, has developed certainly showed that the level of infection that was apparent and the, uh, the impact, uh, the, the trial that, that Andrea ran, uh, again, in a, in a paddock affected by resistance certainly showed that the efficacy of those affected DMI fungicides um, was, was less than we would, would have expected.
So what do we know? We know from, from the, uh, the surveillance that uh, CCDM have been running is that the resistance to group three DMI fungicides in spot form net blotch is spreading in the southern region and in the high rainfall regions of WA. Um, resistance, as in that, that, uh, that um, hybrid was found from 2017 onwards, and at the time was associated with the barley variety Oxford. But what we've seen that it's, and which in, in, and, and seems to be worst in that variety, but what we now know is it's not only associated with Oxford and is it found across the spectrum of the varieties that we grow. Still, if you're, going, if you're thinking about growing Oxford, it's probably a good idea actually not to grow that variety. Um, as Wes said, several, several DMIs are affected and they're affected to different degrees. Um, ideally, uh, the, the spot form net blotch in your crop, uh, get, get a test done um, to know what you're managing. And then look to mix and rotate chemistries to reduce the selection pressure. This is, this is part of management. I, um, I think again, we'll, we'll flip back to Wes here um, for some discussion about the detection of different fungicide resistances in the Eastern States and, and a couple of and a specific uh, um, incident that he, he can re refer to. Yes, thanks again, Jeff. Um, so I'm gonna just touch on briefly on, on the um, wheat powdery mildew. So we've got um, not just DMI resistance, um, in Australia, we've got QOI resistance for the wheat powdery mildew um, that's been detected in Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania. Um, and it's actually quite now widespread um, in the Eastern States. And they've also got, um, again, in the Eastern States, we've got septoria triticae um, showing resistance to um, DMI fungicides again. Um, and what I'm actually gonna focus on most of all is on the um, left-hand side here, we've got the net form net watch situation. Um, and we've got here SDA, just HR resistance, as we'll, we'll get into. But that's the um, going to be the main focus. So if we want to go to the next slide. So this is what we call the um, ground zero of um, fungus in South Australia. So this is, um, this is a site in Middleton, um, which is uh, end of the... Um, York Peninsula in Australia. Um, so this was a field that had been um, barley on barley for year on year. It had been actually been Spartacus on Spartacus. Um, and it had also been Sestiva on Sestiva for uh, year after year. Um, so not exactly the, the greatest um, history of fungicide resistance and disease management in this particular paddock. Um, and you'll see what the result of that kind of practice can possibly be. Um, if we go to the next, so we've got a, um, a survey top of the um, York Peninsula uh, down to the bottom. And we've got here in the SDHIs, you can see on the um, left-hand side map, we've got quite a kind of geographical, um, uh, I suppose you'd say spread. So we've got we got up in the north, there's no SDHI resistance that we detected. Um, and basically, as, as you go further south, closer to closer towards around that particular uh, paddock that I showed earlier, you see that there's a, a higher and higher frequency of um, both reduced sensitivity and resistance um, to SDHI compounds. Um, and that's a pretty bad, but it's also, compounded by the fact that if you look on the um, right-hand side, we've also got DMI, HIS, DMI resistance and DMI reduced sensitivity seems to already be quite a bit more widespread and, and common. Uh, the York Peninsula, including up into the north, which is not all that surprising considering that DMIs have been used for a lot longer time period than um, SDHIs have. There's gonna be, have been a lot more selection pressure, a lot more um, time and opportunity for the fungus to evolve. Um, and the other worrying thing about that is not only do we have 
both SDHI and DMI resistance. So we have resistance to two modes of action, but we actually, if you look at those pie charts, there's actually quite a bit of overlap between the two. So what the upshot of that is, is that not only in the population that we have SDHI and DMI resistance, but we even have individuals that have SDHI and DMI resistance, which is a big problem because, you know, there's probably three main modes of action that you, we have for controlling the net blotches or that are commonly used. And we have isolates or strains that are apparently resistant to uh, two out of those um, compounds, which is definitely a big concern. The kind of thing that uh, we definitely want to make sure does not happen over here, basically. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so basically, I think the take home from that is that we really need to um, focus on um, proper fungicide resistance and disease management. So obviously the kind of practices that I was mentioning in that slide earlier, like uh, barley on barley, you know, the same variety year after year, and the same fungicide, sestiva on sestiva year after year, um, and just the same fungicide compound used sequentially in, a, in any kind of circumstance, no matter, not even just particularly sestiva, but that is a kind of practice that is just gonna be a recipe for um, getting fungicide resistance. And you can, you can see there, it, you can end up not just losing one mode of action, but you can also end up losing two modes of action. Um, so yeah, and with that, I'll uh, pass back to Jeff. Apologies to people, I was speaking whilst muted. Thanks, Wes, I, I think that's a pretty salient message uh, for West Australian growers that um, in a South Australian sense, we've, uh, they, they've had the misfortune of developing that resistance in net type net blots, but certainly it would seem that in some of our uh, growing regions and the, the challenges that we're facing with spot form net blotch are similar to those that you've identified with the, the net form net blotch, and it's certainly something for us to keep an eye on. So we're just gonna briefly touch, I think, here on what, on some, some of the, the factors involved in fungicide resistance management. What can, what can we do to, to uh, help in terms of, of resistance management? And I think, I think if, you, if, you don't, if you don't leave here with any other message today, then basically integrated disease management is the basis of a good fungicide, fungicide resistance management program. So using all the, the, the tools in the head um, to address a disease risk is certainly the way to help to uh, maintain uh, the, the, the fungicides that we have. So if we have a look at a, if we have a look at a, if we consider resistance management or disease management, I guess, um, as, a, as a, a pyramid or a triangle, um, what we're basing, what we base our first, um, uh, our, our first approach to disease management on should be variety selection. Start with a solid foundation of, a, of, of the variety that you're using. So if we go and have a look at our um, West Australian Crop Variety Sowing Guide, um, which is where we can find all the information we need to have about the resistance status of the varieties that we're growing. Um, if we go back in history, as I said, and we talk about when uh, powdery mildew resistance was first detected in um, in Western Australia around in the late 2000s. Um, 60 to 70 percent of the crop area was sown to varieties which were susceptible to very susceptible. So we had almost no genetic resistance being deployed and certainly in that in those high disease risk environments of the south coast um, we were sowing very susceptible varieties. Powdery mildew is not such an issue in Western Australia at the moment, despite the, uh, despite the, uh, the situation with, with fungicide resistance. And the reason for that, primarily, I would consider is that there is, or well, two, I guess one is that there are some, some alternate options in terms of uh, fungicides to use. But more importantly, if we have a look at our variety resistance rankings, we can see now that, that in fact, um, we have a range of resistances available for us to us 
and that many of the agronomically um, suitable varieties that growers are wanting to grow are actually uh, in that resistant end of the spectrum. Unfortunately, when it comes to spot form net blotch, we're not quite of our varieties are in the susceptible end, which does put some pressure on our, on our farming system and our fungicide systems. Um, I am aware that there are new varieties that will be coming to market in the next few years, which will offer us some opportunity. And certainly we should be looking to as those to reduce the pressure that we're, uh, that we're under. What does that mean in terms of, what does variety resistance mean? Not only does it mean less disease, but it means less yield loss as a result of uh, disease infection. And certainly here with spot type net blotch, we can see a, a consistent um, reduction in yield loss as we move from susceptible to resi moderately resistant varieties. That affects even grain. We're talking about something like powdery mildew. Uh, this is some work again done by Kith J. Asina. Just to, just to point out how the difference, what a difference the the the, the regions can make in terms of the need for a fungi. So Bodan was suffering 25 to 28 percent yield loss in the trials that Keith was. And moderately resistant and resistant varieties were suffering suffering somewhere between two and six percent. So, the value of resistance is paramount in uh, managing disease. Next up the chain. Notice we're putting, before we get to fungicide, we're then talking about non-chemical farm management approaches. So what are we talking about? Well, we've, we've, already, we've already discussed variety selection where it's where possible. But then depending on your disease, it's, it's, it's looking at, if we're talking about the net, the net blotches, we're talking about crop rotation. Maybe we're talking about stubble management and you can see some, some fairly rampant burning going on there in that picture. If we're talking about your, your mildews or your talking about maintaining a healthy, uh, well uh, fertilised crop, that optimum growth of the crop. If we're, we're talking about maybe uh, whether or not this is, a, is, is widely used and certainly in, in current times with a move to earlier seeding times, time of sowing can impact on the, the disease pressure that a crop is under. And quite possibly, maybe where we need to be considering is if some of our paddocks are going to be sown into high disease risk circumstances. They are the paddocks that we sow later in our program to at least have some reduction in the disease pressure in those paddocks. Spot form net blotch is the disease, the disease at the moment, obviously. Um, 90, the paddocks that we've, we've looked at in the last couple of years have had significant levels of spot form net blotch. 95% of the crop area is sown to susceptible varieties. It's a stubble-borne disease. As we increase the area of continuous barley, we are exposing those, those crops to early onset of either these, uh, the top line is showing some ascospores being produced on, on stubble. The bottom line is showing some canidia being produced on stubble. So we're, we're exposing those uh, crops are most adjacent to stubble to being bathed with these, fun, these uh, spores early in their life which really puts the pressure on, puts selection pressure onto our fungicides. We certainly don't want to be faced with this sort of circumstance in a continuous barley cropping of you know, seedling expression of spot form net blotch. This is the sort of circumstance that applies maximum selection pressure uh, to our fungicides. And then right at the top of that tree, in terms of uh, managing our crop, we come to fungicide. And if we're talking about, and I've already talked about the fungicides that we have, we're talking about chemical management tips. And I guess this is something that we need to bear in mind uh, now for maybe, maybe there's, you know, we're, we're moving in, into spring and, and probably we're in some crops in the southern part of, the, of Western Australia, we're moving into thinking about uh, final fungicide applications. What are some of the tips that we, we need to think about to maintain our our fungicides for as long as possible. Well, only spray if necessary. Limit the applications. Um, if there isn't, if, if the fungicide isn't needed, then there's, there's no need to apply it. Choose the most effective fungicide for the diseases present. Know what you're, what you're trying to manage. That table that we looked at before, choose mixtures with different modes of action. So don't just go with the same, the same mode of action all the time. 
don't use the same group three fungicide consecutively, alternate sprays. So that you know, it's probably it's time of, uh, the time of two tilts is done. Um, avoid using your group seven SDHIs and your group 11 strobe fungicides um, more than once in a season. And remember that uh, SDHI uh, seed dressing fungicides or uh, strobe uh, in furrow fungicides are a shot of fungicide. That is your use of those fungicides in that season. Make sure you use your fungicides in a uh, protective approach rather than trying to cure a crop. And don't compromise the effective control. Stay within your label rates. And if you've got any questions, then monitor your paddocks and test just and get sample samples set in for testing. Know what you're dealing with. Finally, I guess the fact of the matter is that fungicide resistance is here. Don't panic, but it is time to, to, to act. We need to reduce the reliance on fungicide as our sole disease management tool. Basically, if, if the system ties us to fungicide, can we alter the system? And that was that, uh, that pyramid of, of management we were talking about. We need to think about fungicides as a finite resource. We don't, we don't want to waste them. And we have options. There's different, as the table suggested, there are different modes of action, different application technologies at seeding, on fertilizer, as a foliar fungicide. It gives us many ways to achieve our goal. And from my, from my point of view, tying into this about whether you actually need the fungicide at the time, always ask, is your fungicide actually getting a positive return on investment? If the answer to that question is no, then you probably don't need to apply that fungicide. And I think at this moment, we'll say uh, thank you very much. Awesome, thanks so much for that. Um, Jeff, could I just grab the next slide there? Yep, just a reminder to ask questions. Um, and can I grab the next slide again? Jeff, so we'll, we'll be online for another few minutes if you've got questions. Um, just a reminder that we are a large network. You might see many friendly faces in there. Um, so please reach out to any of us, um, even if you're not calling in from WA today, or um, if you're looking for a canola webinar or something like that, we had Steve and Ange specifically look at them as well. Um, and next slide, Jeff. Yep, so um, yeah, we'd just like to encourage you to connect with AFRIN as much as possible if you've got an interest in it. Um, we'll be out um, early or before the next season. Um, we've got all the webinars now up online that you can get to on the AFRIN website. Um, and we'll be sending, you can sign up to um, for email alerts and things like that on that website. Um, the other thing that I'll just um, draw your attention to is just to make sure you do get in touch with your regional plant pathologists as a first point. As Jeff noted, there are a number of reasons why fungicides can fail and they'll know what's going on in the region and what makes sense and what does. We're based here in South Perth, we've got Kith down in Albany and we've got Andrea and Esperance. Um, and if you're in a region that's different to that, they'll certainly point you in the right direction. Um, and you're welcome to get in touch with the CCDM staff as well. Um, if you've got any questions, we've just got Fran's contact details there as well. Because um, we're, yeah, if you suspect it, let us know what you think's happening and we can see what we can do. Um, just before I go to the questions we do have, just, um, a quick, you'll see at the side there if you've got the chat function open, um, if you've got a couple of minutes to give us your feedback, um, there'll also be an opportunity to a link through a, um, an email that should be sent later today with a link to the recording of the webinar. If you want to share it with other people as well, that'd be great. Um, so I guess uh, I've got one question here. Um, I, so we've actually got Kith on the line as well. Um, so Kith's actually worked on fungicide resistance way back in the day um, with Richard Oliver on those barley, that barley powdery mildew situation when it first popped up. Um, and so I just wanted to ask Kith, because I've heard that you've um, seen some powdery mildew around in the south at the moment. Um, 
and whether you can just tell us a little bit more and how you think growers can manage for it this season. Oh, yep, Keith, we'll just need you off mute. <laughs> Brilliant, Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, we see a few locations in the south coast, uh, Albany Port Zone and Esperance Port Zone on uh, Mildew and you uh, and we. And uh, your question is, uh, uh, what is going, is going to risk of epidemic for this season? Now, when it comes to epidemic, there are conditions should be favorable to go through. We know for Bali, when the plants get uh, late stage infection, the yield losses will be much uh, lesser than when early infection. For example, early infection at tillering stage can be about 20% and late infection can be about uh, about uh, 10 to 20%, but mostly, most time, it will be about 10%. But when in the same token, if you take about wheat powdery mildew, northern region, uh, head infection, that's, that is the issue. So that has a big impact on the yield. Now, regarding the epidemic for this season, uh, to develop an epidemic, there should be about uh, 15 to 22 degrees centigrade temperature ideal and high humidity. But if the temperature, this is applied for wheat and barley itself, but if it's the temperature over 25 and high heavy rain will reduce the infection process, okay? So what is going to happen now and later, depending on what the, how the weather is going to be turned. Today, the bomb, there was an information came, it is going to be above average, but the temperature going to be maximum minimum, temperature going to be above average for WA. So how do you, what is, how you are going to manage it? If the crop is already gone into the ground, uh, the only way you can manage this disease is by these diseases in two crops are uh, from fungicide use. And people have to be more aware about when it comes to barley, uh, Roslin barley, Pranad barley, uh, they are using that in a wider areas for early sowing, for, for sheep as a sheep feed, then as a crop. But Pranad barley got a good source of resistance. So you have to be keep eye on the Roslin and Spartacus. And most of the wheat varieties, what they are growing, uh, the noodle wheat varieties like Septa, Ninja, Supreme, and Old Kalangari, they are highly susceptible for mildew. So keep eye on it. But at the moment, only Esperance region, they have detected uh, mildew on Septa wheat. So STHI, the principles are the very same when you are using fungicide. With Respective of whether you are using to control the net blotch or mildew, the principles are the same. Try to use different mode of action and not to use more than two per season and not to repeat the same compound. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if they are going to grow barley or wheat next year, if there is an issue on mildew, there are ways and means of controlling them. For example, all those things, uh, Jeff in his talk mentioned about it. Mm -hmm. The key to my answer is go to integrated disease management. So wherever possible, select the resistant varieties, avoid soil early, then stubble management is very important because the stubble stubbles from barley or wheat, the, the mildew pathogen can survive as a cleostothesia, it's a fruiting body, 
like in net blot pseudothesia what jeff said showed that black dots in the stubbles like that so when it is start raining condition good if no protection those spores will produce from those protein bodies and go to the new crop so that is important and don't try to sow your crop very early because that is the time if it bone diseases that is the time they start to fly if you delay planting then you can work by delay planting than early sowing the other thing is important thing is the crop nutrition is very important mm -hmm. make sure that you don't overfeed the plant with nitrogen then the plants are very susceptible and adequate potassium in the plant itself will be give a manageable control because the plants tends to be more because the reason for that is the how the fungus enter in different ways some fungus spores enter from the damaged leaf tissue some entered from the uh, stomata so mildew can be entered spores from the damaged tissue so if your plant is uh, with good potassium potassium silicate can prevent that and prevent the uh, wind damage by rubbing the leaves can damage the rubbing with the wind the leaves can damage mm -hmm. when they start rubbing so if you have good potassium potassium silicate will prevent that so those are the things you have to look into yeah. but uh, see how that's all i can mention about no, that's great. Yeah, it's a good good reminder. You need to have everything in balance there, Kip, to get the best out of your IDM strategies. Um, I'm just going to go on to, I've had another question for Fran or Wes. Um, so what is the status of net form, net blotch resistance? We didn't touch on it greatly today. Um, I don't know who wants to, to fight to answer that one. Fran's on, so. You want to go ahead with that one, Wes? <laughs> I think that's a back to you, Fran. <laughs> so can you be more specific with it, with the question? Was there any additional information there? Um, no, just curious about what's happening with the net blotches. Like we haven't seen anything nasty other than the hybrid situation, I guess. Um, and it's uh, not seeming it's to a, stick up it's very, its head. It's a very dynamic situation and, you know, you can expect pretty much anything. Um, you know, I think that it's reasonable to expect the same the same situations that you can see developing in other areas to develop, you know, in Western Australia, especially in regions where, you know, the same uh, strong uh, barley rotations are followed and, you know, the same fungicides are used. You know, this is just part of, part of nature. Um, and that's why we really need to keep vigilant and, you know, keep monitoring our, our crops, make sure that we are on top of, you know, um, of the treatments that we not, you know, don't overload those crops with uh, the same fungicide over and over again. And, and as Jeff was saying before, just, you know, monitor and, and test if you suspect resistance, right? Um, but before you do that, just get in touch and, and, uh, and just discuss whether, you know, the, the, the lack of activity or performance of your application might be due to other factors or actually, it could be, you know, that the reason is resistance, but, you know, get in touch and discuss the problem. Yep. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Fran. Yeah, because a lot of people would have seen a few of our webinars by now, and we have that um, really scary story out of um, South Australia, and we use it because we really don't want anyone else to go down that path. Um, so we just had another question. Um, just wondering, Fran, if you could comment on the powdery mildew situation in Tasmania, because you were there from the yes. Um, I you know, this is wheat powdery mildew. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So look, um, we've been doing a, a couple of surveys across Tasmania. Um, so uh, in terms of resistance. Resistance to QI is is extremely extremely widespread. So we have found it in every region that have sampled there, and, and the frequencies have gone from uh, levels of 10% uh, in the regions where we have found the lowest 
to frequencies of consistently 100 percent right oh, wow. in the in in regions that actually with a with a with a higher production of a uh, of wheat that basically makes sense so the more wheat we've got around the more host the more potential inoculum floating around and more selection pressure is going to happen there so because we're going to be putting more fungicides to control the disease um so in terms of um and and and, and i think that jeff was touching on this before i mean for qois this is not like a um and a small increase in 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 situations where we go from crops that are, or diseases that are sensitive to the compound to you know next season we've got the same disease being resistant totally resistant to the same compound right so in the case of group three or dmis um we have detected a, a new genotype that was found so this genotype was found first in Tasmania, then in uh, Victoria, and and lastly in South Australia, and and it's actually correlated with some um, interesting reduced level of sensitivity to the certain DMIs. Not all of the DMIs, just certain DMIs. So this is still under under basically under research. So we are trying to to determine a bit better what are the uh, the the linkages between the mutations that we have found and the different compounds and but this is also spreading so as i said we found it first in Tasmania, but you know it has been actually uh, consistently found in victoria and in south australia as well mm -hmm. yep no worries um and i guess we're getting pretty close to time and i know fran probably has to run off to a lecture very very soon so we'll just close things off there but thank you so much for attending you'll hear from us very soon with the recording Thanks a lot to um, Wes, Keith, Jeff and Fran for being on the line and the Ag Communicators team in the background. Um, and please get in touch. We're, we're here to help. Cheers then. Thanks.